Brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, even your relatives' information, it's all out there. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Ken Maines here from Unsolved No More. Listen, every once in a while, a product comes along that changes the game. That's Aura. It's so easy to set up. I did it in under three minutes. Listen, my family is my number one priority, keeping them safe. It's your priority too. That's why I partnered with Aura. 24 seven monitoring, parental controls, antivirus, and so much more in one app. Listen, you guys know I'm huge on integrity. And I would never endorse something that I did not personally use or believe in. And that's why I'm asking you to sign up for a free two-week trial of Aura. Just go to the link below in the comments, in the description. www.aura.com backslash unsolved no more. Sign up for your two-week free trial and get the protection that you and your family deserves. Okay, good morning. It is Monday. We're back at it. I guess there were some comments on my Facebook page that people thought I met an early demise. You could not be so lucky. Um, I guess that's because how episode 15 kind of ended with uh, my anonymous uh, informant stating that I should be very, very careful and... I should be scared, basically. Well, as you can see, I'm sitting here enjoying my coffee in the morning uh, with not a shred of fright on my face. Might be some other things on my face, like this black and blue eye that I can't get rid of for two years. But besides that, I am intact and ready to rock and roll. So what does that mean? What is today's episode about? This is an update. Okay, I want to provide my audience with what's been going on. Because there's a lot of things behind the scenes that I basically, I can't, maybe I could, but I don't have any intention of showing all the research on a computer, all the phone calls and the people that don't answer. I, mean, I don't have time to be messing around with cameras and doing all that stuff that YouTubers do. And again, I'm not a YouTuber. I'm a detective using this platform and the followers for a purpose. Get the cases out there. And that's what I intend to do. And I don't have time to set up cameras for walk-by shots or... You know, all these things, I that's not me. Now, if one of you want to come and film me doing all that stuff, well, get a hold of me and then maybe we can talk. But until then, it's me doing my thing for the most part and then sitting down here and telling you about it. Now, I have gone out and done some interviews and recorded, but I've done other interviews recently that I've recorded, but those people don't want it out there and it's understandable and I'm a man of my word and listen like I told Bobby in that last episode is that um, I worked in with informants my whole career okay I, I was in law enforcement for 16 years and eight of those years I worked undercover whether I was running a drug task force whether I was undercover with the FBI, 
whatever it was. I, I've used informants my, my whole life. Um, and I've dealt with biker gangs. I've dealt with the Bloods, the Crips, uh, the Mafia. I've investigated every single one of those type of people. And not one time have I come out of it and said, I'm afraid for my life. Uh, maybe that's naive. Maybe it is what it is. That's, listen, when the good Lord wants me and calls me, it'll be my time. Whether it's by the hands of um, Tommy D. Simone from Goodfellas or whether it's from... What's the guy's name from the Brian Bosworth movie? Stone. Stone Cold. Not The Wrestler. There was a good movie, I think, with Brian Bosworth in it. It was a biker gang. Or I could have used Sons of Anarchy and Chibs or Tig. I would say Jax, but I think I could take Jax. Although some of you will disagree with that. I digress. Listen. An investigation is investigation. You, you, you can't get scared and run away with your tail tucked between your legs and say, uh, no. If, if you do that, you're in the wrong profession. Get out and go play golf or something. You know, go teach kindergarten. You're a detective. You're an investigator. You follow all routes, all angles, no matter if it's dangerous or whether you're scared or, or whatever. Um, I just never been in a position where I've gotten scared and that's not being uh, arrogant or cocky. That's just the truth. And again, this is all about transparency and honesty. I think the police departments, they don't like to give things out. If you don't believe me, think of any cold case that you want, go contact that police department and see if they'll give you police reports. No. Now you can, try to do a freedom of information act and you'll get something with maybe a cover letter and then everything else that's redacted. But what's that tell you? Okay. I'm trying to be the opposite of that. I've been there. Now, when family members used to call me when I was um, a detective on the job and want to know about their case, I would tell them I would be as transparent as possible. Now, if an average citizen called me, well, yeah, that's a little bit different. Well, why do you want to know? This is just curiosity, um, things like that. But I think being transparent is something that's very important for our government. Because that's when conspiracy theories start. When you feel people are keeping something from you. Well, why? Why is the government, why are the police not telling me this? Hence, me, in this investigation, trying to tell you everything that I know. Now, in this Brenda Condon investigation, I'm behind the eight ball because I don't have police reports. And Spring Township is not talking to me. Whether that's because they don't know that I'm doing this, which I doubt, or they they don't want to whether they don't like me they don't like that this is being reopened to show any signs of incompetence that they may have had and we're going to get into that a little bit today after my talk with a trooper on our thoughts on the spring township police department in 1991 in regards to this case so you have to understand that Putting this stuff on YouTube is secondary. Now, I know you don't want to hear that because you want to see you're, in, you're vested in it. But in reality, this is an investigation. This isn't a podcast in, in, or investigative journalism or any bullshit like that. This is a detective doing an investigation 33 years later. It's nothing new to me. You know, I've done that for the past two decades. But what is new is that this is the first time I'm actually putting it live as it's happening, kind of, on YouTube. And again, YouTube's a platform that I just choose to use because, you know, I got a bunch of subscribers on there. Now, if you go back and look at my Jolene Witt 
video. I did two of those, part one and two. Yes, I was involved in that. Um, and there's a lot of police reports and stuff that I use. It's, it's probably the best video, I think, that informative-wise that I've done. But that was different. That was 10 years later or whatever it is. And I'm doing this active now. So you're seeing a lot of it. You just seen 15 episodes. But there's 15 more episodes that I didn't make. Because I just don't feel that it's compelling enough to put on, on here for you guys to view. And I'm not going to waste my time. And there's some things that I can't put in there. Now you're saying, oh, you're being... Just like the government. You're not being transparent, Kenny. Well, for the integrity of investigations and your relationship with informants, that's the way it has to be. For example, I went and met with an in, two individuals last week who said they had information on this case. And it was credible enough that I actually went and met with them. Listen, I get a lot of tips in. And you have to vet those tips. Hey, listen, are, are they full of shit? We've talked about this before. I felt this one had some credible aspects to it. So I met with them. Two of the greatest, nicest people you'll ever meet in your life. And I was glad that I did it. However, they are wary of their names being out there. They're wary of repercussions. Maybe not drug repercussions or nefarious people repercussions. Just you have to understand a case like this is intertwined in businesses, uh, family relations. And you don't want to, some people don't want to shake that up. And I get it. So when they tell me, hey, you can talk to me. And I say, hey, can I record this um, th th for an episode? In this case, they said, no, prefer not. And, I, and my retort to that is that that's fine, but I am going to record this. If you, if you don't want that, then I will leave. And the reason for that is 33 years now down the road, Let's. it's been 33 years since Brenda disappeared. 33 years from now, from today, when I'm no longer here and an investigator wants to pick up this case, uh, if it's not solved by then, hopefully it will be. I have everything documented. Like the interview with Carl. Is there another recorded interview with Carl with his statement anywhere? I don't believe that there is. Now why? That's the first thing you want to do is lock somebody into a statement. Well, yeah, it's 33 years later, but we have that now. So when I'm no longer here and the next investigator wants to pick something up, hey, it's there. So in this case, when I went and interviewed these two lovely people, they uh, they did not want me to record it for an episode, but I, I have to record it for the investigation purposes. So I have it from just not having it on here, unfortunately. Hey, that's how it works. It's all about the investigation the integrity of the investigation it's not about views it's not about clicks it's not about podcasts it's not about facebook none of that shit that's it's irrelevant it really is i'm glad that i can put this forth to entertain you and that's a whole other topic that i've gone into before how i don't like how true crime has become entertainment but I understand, okay, it's intriguing. It's really intriguing for the people of Clearfield and Belfont, Zion, Milesburg, sure. So as many of you have saw that I put out a little blurb on Facebook, a message that Brenda's son Todd had sent me saying, you know, the last two weeks or whatever, we've gotten more information from you than the past 33 years from the police. That's what I want. And that's what it's about. You don't know how many times family members reach out to me and say the police tell us nothing. And that, along with not calling the victim's family back 
is my biggest pet peeve in all law enforcement and cold case investigations. There's no reason for it. Now, let me fast forward now that I got all that out and give you an update on how things are going. Things are progressing. A lot of interviews. In addition to the two people that gave me information, and I'll get into what they told me here in a little bit. But before that, I went and met with a former trooper, Pennsylvania State Trooper, that worked on this case. And the reason I reached out to him, because he was one of the initial people there. So I thought. So I reached out to him through a mutual friend, and we were able to hook up. And what a, what a blessing it was for me to meet this state trooper, retired. Such a tremendous, nice individual. Um, even though he wouldn't let me pay for his breakfast, uh, I'll let that slide. I tried. I even grabbed the slip, but he, he grabbed her back. So the information that he provided, and we talked for a good hour or two, and he didn't want anything recorded for an episode. And that wasn't because he's scared of anything or repercussions. He has some health issues and he just didn't think that it would come off good. And, and I understood it and respect that tremendously. But he wasn't able to give me specific details like I wanted. Hey, were the lights on or off? Where was this? You know things of that nature, because he didn't get brought in until he says a couple months later. He did talk about digging up some areas and he admitted that it was because of a psychic. Now, let me explain that. I don't believe in psychics at all. Doesn't appear that he did either, but he said it was because of one of Brenda's family members who gave this information and of course he was reluctant and didn't really want to but he did because of a family member that is an indication of a good police officer especially in cold case investigations and just like he told me what what was i going to tell her no that was perfect um he probably did better than i would have in that scenario because i don't think i would have but he did it for the family member. Very, very important. But obviously they didn't find nothing because no psychic is going to lead you to a body. That's just how it is. If that was the case, they could lead themselves to a million dollars when they don't. So, whatever. I'm not going to get into my psychic rant. But what I will say is this trooper did not recall specifics. So we talked in general terms. Okay, that's how I do interviews. Let's talk about this day. Let's talk about this hour. Let's talk about this time. And then if they don't know, okay, let's expand it out. Let's talk about this year. What did you do during that year? What, what happened? In this case, I was able to at least learn this much. I asked the trooper, what was the thought process of Spring Township? Remember, I can't talk to any Spring Township police officers so far. Um, so this is as close as I can get. He says I, he did not want to be critical. And I understand that. But he also pointed out the differences between a state police investigation and maybe a, municip a municipality. And I've seen that in the Jolene Witt case, which I had talked about, where when the state police take over a case, like he said, we would have had roadblocks set up that next night. Whenever she was reported missing, we'd have been stopping cars. Hey, did you, you take this road off in here, Zion Road? Do you see this bar? Did you notice anything unusual? Any cars in the parking lot? You know, getting ID from all these people. That's how the state police would have handled it, which is perfect. Spring Township didn't do that. Now, again, I don't think they were used 
to a missing persons case like this. But more importantly, what he told me is when I asked him the question, what was their thought process when this happened? February 26, 1991. And his response, I believe, is indicative of everything that was wrong with this case. And he said, they thought that she was a party girl and that she would show up. And when she didn't pick up her kids that weekend, it was like, oh shit. That sums up the whole case right there. Okay? Hindsight is always 2020. I can sit here and bash the police and, you know, say they should have done that. Um, but I won't because I wasn't there. Okay? Now, I'd like to say, yeah, I would have done things differently. I would have taken photographs of the bar. I would have been there that next day interviewing people. They weren't. So what? You can't, you can't change the past. All you can do is move forward now. I think once Brenda did not pick up her kids, which was Saturday. She went missing Tuesday. I think they did a good job. I really do. It's that four day lapse that I'm critical of, but you know, they thought she was going to show up. It's their mistake. I'll give you a perfect example. I was on patrol one time and I was a rookie. I was with my field training officer and it was a daylight shift and we got a call for suspicious circumstance car parked outside the, the cell block, which is a known bar, big bar. When we got there. There was a car parked in the parking lot. No other cars around. It was all by itself. The door was ajar. The driver's side door was ajar. And this is six o'clock in the morning. A girl's purse is on top of the car. Some of the stuff is removed. And that's what we had run the the tags, find out who it comes back to, get a phone number, nobody's answering. My mind, immediately, this is one year on the job. This is not good. This is not good. This is an abduction. This is, we're going to find this girl in a ditch. And my field training officer, who had been there probably 13, 14 years, um, he was like, well, it's no big deal. She'll show up. Not me. I was in high speed panic mode. Lo and behold, she showed up. She was drunk from the night before, looking for her keys in her purse. Couldn't find the keys, opened the door, fell down. Friend picked her up and she left. Nothing nefarious. So I use that analogy to show you what Spring Township may have been thinking at that time. Circumstances different, but okay. So, now let's get to my interview with the two individuals that wanted to give information and wanted to remain anonymous. They have direct knowledge, they said, of an individual who was in that bar on February 26th. 1991 and was friendly with Brenda. This person is from out of town. That's why no one recognized him. And there is an allegation that he had been in the area for a few months on a work detail, staying at a hotel, and would frequent Carlsbad's Tavern, where he became friendly with Brenda. He may have had some sort of romantic interest, maybe mutual, between the two. 
there is more to that story that I can't get into until I vet it out. Again, that's the worst thing you could do is start rumors on a cold case. Because when I take over the cold case, you get, you get them. There are thousands of rumors and you have to sort through them to get truths. So the last thing I want to do is put out a rumor that I, hey, she was seeing somebody else and this and that when it might not be true. So I'm in the process of vetting this out. I got the gentleman's name and I got his workers who he was in town with. Now the hard part is getting phone numbers to call these people because they're from out of town. And right now I'm not traveling to go knock on their door. If they lived in Milesburg, it'd be a different story. So I'm in the process of running criminal histories, um, addresses, see if they moved, see if there's anything there that hits me, calling peripheral people, not the main suspect, seeing what they tell me. So I'll do a whole episode at some point once I finish out vetting this individual. But it is a story that I have not heard before. It is a name that I have not heard before. So we'll check it out. Might be some truth to it. Obviously, there was enough for me to go interview him. Um, the Crazy Carl interview, everybody, you know, is up in arms about how uh, he's guilty. I reserve judgment. Yes, he said a lot of things. Okay. But I was happy just to get that interview. And there's more to Carl as well than that interview. So when I'm done doing an interview, it just doesn't end there. Okay. Now you have to look into the person's background. You have to find his associates, who he's talking to, any changes in a behavioral pattern after February 26th. Did something else occur? Like, did he not smoke cigarettes prior to February 26th and all of a sudden he's smoking? Things like that that you have to look into. It's a long, meticulous, and tedious process. But it's necessary to do a proper investigation. And do I think the police did a proper investigation? Yes. Again, minus those four days, a lot of things lost there. I think they probably did. I don't know for sure because I haven't seen the reports. Now, next week, I do have an interview lined up with another law enforcement individual that worked on this case. I'll learn more there. So this is a long process and you got to understand I have other things going on as well. I have paid clients, you know, who are paying me to work on things. I have a television show in development um, that I have to work on and I have something that's called life where I have to run the soccer games or gymnastics or whatever it is. Um, I had to tear out a wall yesterday and, and put a door in and do some electrical work. I have to work out. And then I have to sit down at night and watch a new show. I've been watching Bloodline on Netflix. So I have life as well. So if I don't post anything, don't get frightened for me. I just have life going on. But rest assured that all avenues are being covered here. More than what's being shown to you guys. People have sent me photographs recently, last night, of the inside of Carlsbad's Tavern. I have to go over those. I'm so grateful for that. Um, I know as a community, you guys are helping me out tremendously. Um, the theories, again, I go back to episode number one. I'm not interested really in your theories. You can get mad at me all you want about that, um, but your tips I will take. Um, your, your facts. Hey, I was in Carlsbad's Tavern that night. I got emails out to several individuals that have not contacted me back who said they were in the bar that night. 
So things are progressing. Things are moving. Witnesses are still coming forward. Remember, I still have my, my pledge of a $5,000 reward for information that leads to an arrest in this case or Brenda's remains, either or. So that's still out there. And I'm a man of my word. And, you know, if there's one thing that I am, it's a man of my word. If I give you my word, that's the way it's going to be. Talked about that with the Zodiac killing when I investigated that and had to go out to California for the History Channel. I went and met with one of the detectives and he wouldn't share the reports, but he said, uh, you know, I'll allow you to read the reports. Just, you know, don't, don't take them. Yeah, you're a man of my words. I read them and that was it. I never shared it. Verbally, but I didn't physically give the reports to anybody. Because um, I told them that I wouldn't do that. So, you know, that reward's still out there. If you know where Brenda is, what happened to her, get a hold of me. I'm easy to find. Just Google my name. I think my website will come up. So that's it. There may not be an episode every day at six o'clock. Okay, going forward. But there will be episodes being released periodically that you'll just have to tune in and, and watch. And hopefully, at the end of this, we can say it was all worthwhile and it was a community and team effort because of the people that sent me the pictures of the bar, because of the people that gave me information about her having some sort of affair with somebody from out of town, because somebody came forward and said, hey, this is the drug information I had. All of that, we did it together. And that's what I want to accomplish. And again, I never want to make anybody look bad, especially the police. Again, hindsight's always 20, 20. Um, they had reasons for doing what they did. I'm not somebody to, to chastise. Now, if it's blatant, then I have to, and I will. Just because I was a cop doesn't mean that I defend cops 100%. No, if they're wrong, I'll tell them that they're wrong. If they don't like it, that's tough. Same with the civilian. So, you know, the, the psychic who wanted to get all tough with me, you know, and cut off communication and this and that, and then threaten me with a, a lawyer. Um, <laughs> listen, this is not my first rodeo. It's not the first time I've been threatened with an attorney. Okay. So uh, go back to the drawing board on that. We're going to do this together meticulous investigation we're going to cover all angles the second worst thing you can do in an investigation is give up okay maybe that's number one it might slow down and that's how cases become cold i i promise you within the last five years nobody was looked did anything in this brenda condon case other than when an anniversary comes around they will throw out a reward now, I know the state police every so often, six months, whatever it is, they have to do a GI report and they have to annotate, hey, no new leads or whatever it is. And that report goes in with the binder of the all of the information, all the reports in the last 33 years. But that doesn't mean they're working on the case. And I guarantee that they're not because I work cold cases. I know how it is. Unless an active lead comes in that you have to follow up, you're not pulling that binder off the shelf because you got other things that you're working on. You have other cases where other leads are coming in. So you follow them up. A good cold case investor has to, has to be proactive, not reactive. Same thing about a patrol officer, you know, you have patrol officers who just cruise their zone, wait for a call to come in, go and handle their call, go tuck themselves away, write their report, and wait for the next one. That's reactive. And you have proactive. 
you're looking down alleyways, seeing somebody that's not doing something, you know, that's, you know, shady coming out of a, a, a drug house. Go up and talk to him. Yeah, he can tell you to go pound sand, but at least you tried. Maybe he will talk to you. And maybe you'll see that little baggie hanging out of his jean front pocket. And to give you a probable cause to search him. And you find out it's a, it's cocaine. And then you flip him and you go in the house and you get an ounce of cocaine. You flip him and you're going to New York. And now you're getting kilos of cocaine. All because of your proactive approach. That's how you police. That's what law enforcement's supposed to be. Cold cases are the same thing. Yeah, you're going to hit a dead end. But pull that binder back out and read it again. There's something in there that's going to trigger you to be like, ah, oh, how did I miss this? I got to go back and talk to this guy. Hopefully that's what this is doing. It's my hope. It's triggering some memories, some maybe repressed memories, and also triggering the, the police investigators at Rockview take a look i don't know maybe maybe not regardless i'm going to be here investigating and that's the bottom line not because stone cold said so because kenny main said so so keep tuning in i appreciate all your guys uh emails of support and caring about brenda remember it's all about brenda and her family and friends that's it that's what it's about if you have that mindset and you think about that, I think we will be successful. And hey, if we don't solve the case, that's fine. At least we're bringing it out and we're trying. And that's what we're, that's the number one goal is you have to try. Okay. So thanks for watching. Until next time, Mains out.